thank you again for joining our panel, uh, Library of Congress, uh, Political Science Resources uh, and Opportunities. Uh, my name is uh, Corey Charles Gooding. I am an assistant professor of political science at the University of San Diego. Uh, and I'm really excited to welcome uh, our panelists here today. Um, we have some important resources that are available through the Library of Congress. And uh, we have our panelists, Jenna Dietz, uh, Jesse Holland, uh, and Leroy Bell Jr. will uh, also join us uh, to share with some of those resources that are available. Uh, so I'm not going to take up too much space. I wanna turn it over quickly to uh, Ms. Jana Dietz, uh, who is the Klug Center Program Specialist in Outreach and Partnerships. She's a political scientist with research interests in legislative politics, women in politics, and civic engagement. And she will offer an overview of the Klug Center and the opportunities for scholars. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jen Nadine. Good morning. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, I wanted to um, thank you all for giving us the opportunity to share with NCOPE's uh, members today some information about the Library of Congress and the Kluge Center, of which I'm a part, um, and so I would like to um, start with a presentation uh, to um, guide our comments today. Can everyone see my screen? Not just yet. Okay. Are you able to uh, see this now? Yes, indeed. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see. So just to um, give a brief overview about the, the Kluge Center, um, we are a scholarly center within the Library of Congress, and we've had almost a thousand scholars and residents in the past 20 years. Our past scholars include former heads of state, including names like Václav Havel. We've also had luminary thought leaders such as William Julius Wilson and Ibram, Ibram Kendi, who have conducted research at the Library uh, Center as well. Uh, two, two decades ago, the largest gift at the time ever given to the library uh, in the amount of $60 million was given by John W. Kluge, who wished to support, promote, and celebrate research important to understanding the human condition research that would be designed to be accessible to the public um, and to the broader policymaking community. This gift took shape specifically as a center that offers residential scholarly experiences housed inside the historic Jefferson Building of the Library of Congress. The center's location is important to understanding the commitment to supporting scholarship with a public engagement focus. The Kluge Center itself is located literally just outside the library's beautiful main reading room. Kluge scholars have full access to all library resources, events, and collections. They have well-appointed offices and intern support. They have regular interaction with other scholars in this community to keep the creative and synergistic juices flowing. And they have access to a wide variety of national and international players in the policy world. Simply put, it is an inspiring location for research and writing for public impact. Um, let me advance through the screen here. Um, our next slide is uh, uh, presenting the, the idea of connecting thought and action. This is our, uh, our center's mission and how we best describe it. Um, you'll see that, that we describe this um, as the Kluge Center supporting scholars uh, doing innovative and specialized work in the human sciences and, pro and projects scholarly work to a broader audience through public events, congress congressional events, and um, social media. Um, bridging what is too often the divide between ideas and implementation, as we can see at the, with the John W. Kluge quote at the bottom of the screen, um, this is truly what guides our work with our scholars. 
Um, we bring scholar ideas into the public space through in-person and virtual events, uh, regardless of the format. And in person, we hope to see you again real soon. Um, part of our commitment is to supporting our engaged scholars uh, to help promote their work very widely. Again, because of its location in the library, Kluge Scholar events, blogs, and newsletters go out to a listserv reaching over 35,000 subscribers. Our virtual events average over 2,000 views, and our social media, including tweets and Facebook, also have a far reach. Um, we promote our scholars widely to help maximize the impact of their research and their voices on the important conversation of the moment. And speaking of conversations, um, we title our series and our, our both of our outreach uh, series, one for the event, one for events for the public and one for Congress, but we titled them Conversations on the Future of Democracy. Just to give you a feel for the kinds of events that we do to help promote our scholars, um, you can see some of the examples here. Everything from um, comparative perspectives on politics and culture in Europe, the future of political parties, um, uh, previous Kluge Prize winner and um, president of Harvard, Dr. Faust, uh, was in conversation with Dr. Hayden to discuss women's leadership. Um, we see examples of using big data and the role that plays in democracy. Uh, and of course, uh, the example of Jesse here um, with Adam Rothman discussing African-American passages. That's one type of event that we have. Another type of event is outreach specifically for Congress, um, for members and also high um, level uh, staff. Um, and you can see some examples here as well um, of, of issues of import uh, with regard to China, Russian election interference, um, interbranch relations, uh, interpreting data again, um, uh, member effectiveness. We also have a particular type, which I wanna highlight here um, of uh, outreach to Congress, which involves breakfast conversations with thought leaders. Um, we can bring in some of our scholars. And in fact, Jesse participated in one of these breakfast conversations uh, where we have these intimate off the record conversations with members where they can have a real back and forth with that um, thought leader. It can be a Kluge scholar. Um, we've also brought in folks like um, Tara Westover, who was the author of the book Educated, um, if you remember um, that, that, recent, um, that recent work. Um, in addition to these conversations, we also actively seek out other opportunities to promote scholarship supporting our mission throughout the entire year. A good example, just recently in February, we selected two important works highlighting accessible and thought-provoking scholarship in honor of Black History Month. The first um, was titled African-American Political Thought, A Collected History by Melvin Rogers and Jack Turner. Um, and this happened to feature a former Kluge Distinguished Visiting Scholar, uh, Melvin Rogers was a DBS as we call them in 2019. Um, the second featured uh, scholarship uh, was uh, Vanguard, How Black Women Broke Barriers, Won the Vote, and Insisted on Equality for All by Martha Jones. Uh, this highlights the important stories of Black women in the fight for suffrage and political equality. We look for, ex for opportunities throughout the year to highlight our scholars and the thought-leading scholarship that fits our mission. Um, so that's another example of our outreach. Just to give you a, an overview or some ideas of some of the, the types of research that's been conducted uh, at Kluge, I did a quick search of our projects uh, using library collections uh, that matched with the NCOPES conference theme. Um, you can see they represent everything from civil rights history, movement history, gender and global context, intellectual leadership, et cetera. Um, a wide variety of research can be supported and enhanced by the resources at the library. Leroy will talk much more about that. All of these resources are available to Kluge scholars. Uh, so there are a couple of paths in terms of uh, becoming a, a scholar in residence at the Kluge Center. Um, one of those is through the path of, of becoming a, a Kluge chair. These prestigious selections begin with a nomination process, moving on to a, a highly selective evaluation and then ultimately nomination by Dr. Carla Hayden, the Librarian of Congress. These appointments are generally for 11 to 12 months, and depending on the type of chair, will provide opportunities for formal speaking engagements with Congress, Hill staff, other scholars, and or the public. Um, some examples, uh, again, from this slide, you can see the, the various types that we have available. Um, we have a category for countries and cultures of the global north. 
countries and cult cultures of the global south, American law and governance, technology and society, modern culture. And then we have specific examples that represent some of the partnerships uh, that we have um, specifically uh, in, in, in key areas. So for example, the Kissinger Chair in Foreign Policy and International Relations, the McGuire Chair in Ethics and American History, uh, the Bloomberg NASA Chair uh, in Astrobiology, US-Russia and US-China Relations, um, the Kislak Chair um, in the History and Culture of the Early Americas using the uh, you know, amazing Kislak collection at the library, um, and then we have two newer examples, um, and these are shorter term um, in length. So the chair in congressional policymaking um, is also uh, a three month um, opportunity. And the distinguished visiting scholar opportunity is also something that could take more of a semester length, um, uh, shorter uh, term um, at the library. Uh, again, for more information on these particular chair opportunities, um, I've included the link at the bottom of this uh, site. Um, slide so that you can um, read up on the specific um, examples of, of each. Um, we also have opportunities for fellowships. Um, and um, I would note that the top two highlighted the Kluge Fellows and the Kluge Digital uh, Media Studies Fellows. Those uh, fellowships now have a universal deadline of, the, um, the, um, of July 15th. Um, and we also want to bring your attention to a new opportunity on this list uh, for the Article I Fellowship. We will fund um, with a, a, a great um, a collaboration um, with uh, the Democracy Fund to host two fellows um, studying congressional form broadly defined. Uh, this will include everything from issues of access, representation, leadership, um, or process. Um, and importantly, we are taking applications for this one now. When you think of the fellowships, these are not the senior, senior scholars, but are more of the um, postdoc emerging scholars. Uh, and so in the case of the Article I fellowship, uh, we, um, you can think of this as, as, as a postdoc. And as long as you are not um, past seven years being out of, of getting the PhD, you're eligible to apply uh, for that as well. Um, and those can be also for next academic year. Again, the link is at the bottom here as well. Uh, one other thing about this particular list, you can see that some of these are tied to specific collections in the library. Again, um, uh, Leroy may speak more to that. Um, and if you, at the beginning, um, we talked about the, the Kluge Center um, and John Kluge's uh, desire to want to support and recognize research of public import. And here's basically, um, one, of the, one of the key signature ways in which that was highly visibly accomplished, and that was through the creation of the Kluge Prize. Um, this is a significant prize, um, half a million dollars, um, that he intended to be on par with the prize like the Nobel Prize, to celebrate those who study the human sciences uh, with, with the intent of improving humanity. Um, the library describes the importance and the connection of this prize uh, here that the library was created based on the notion that ideas matter, that thought must inform public policy for the nation to thrive and for humankind to advance. Establishing the link between knowledge and governance is at the heart of everything we do at the Kluge Center. The Kluge Prize was, was created to celebrate the achievement of that goal. The nomination criteria, as you can see, befit the significance and prestige of this recognition. Um, nominees are expected to have developed in their creative pursuits and career unique insights into the forces that have shaped and continue to shape humankind. Candidates should be distinguished by their intellectual achievements, by the fundamental importance of their work and its impact on public affairs, as well as the ability to communicate the significance of their work to broad audiences. Um, we are very pleased to share with you that Dr. Daniel Allen, political scientist and political theorist at Harvard University, is our 2020 Kluge Prize winner. Um, I want to invite you to the series that she has developed following the theme of Our Common Purpose. Danielle helped lead the American Academy of Arts and Sciences report by the same name. For her Kluge Prize year, she offers this series giving actionable steps in the areas of media, elections, and history so that we can understand, so that we can take actionable steps to strengthen our democracy. Um, if you are interested in attending these events one per month for the next uh, um, three months, um, you can register at the website at the site that is provided on this slide. I sat in yesterday and I can tell you that these are really, really well done um, and very thought provoking. Um, it's really an excellent, um, an excellent series. 
lastly, I would just like to um, uh, mention that in terms of the experience and professional impact of being a scholar in residence at the Kluge Center, um, our scholars consistently tell us that it has helped advance their writing and their research. Um, it, uh, the chance to use the library's collections and enri enrich the research experience. Um, um, and many have reported that they've been able, been very successful in their publication efforts following their time with us. Another benefit that I would also like to highlight in terms of the professional impact is the chance to expand and grow your own professional networks with other scholars, uh, with the library and its resources, with those at Kluge, with those, um, uh, it, uh, with those on Capitol Hill, and for DC-based organizations. These are networks that, can, that you can take back to your home institutions, your subfield, and, sh and, and take that benefit to your students to help grow your own impact as well. Um, Kluge likes to stay in contact with its alumni, as Jesse <laughs> will attest. Um, and so that, that, in a nutshell, is, is my overview of the Kluge uh, Center and the opportunities for in-residency scholarship that we, that we provide. Um, another slide that I would, would like to be able to share with you now is one on an internship opportunity for students. Um, the library has a new uh, program starting in um, this fall, um, the Archives History and Heritage Advanced Internship Program. Um, this is specifically designed for students, um, undergraduate and graduate students from HBCUs. Um, they will be selecting up to 14 interns um, and the applications open later this month. Um, a 10 week immersive experience, 20 hours per week. Uh, it is a paid internship with a professional development series. Um, these are just fantastic opportunities for students to, to, uh, to be able to be exposed to um, all the library has to offer. And if, if you can share this information with your students or with others that are interested, we would certainly appreciate that. Uh, thank you. Um, if there are other uh, questions that you have, or uh, about our programs, about our center, about our events, um, please contact either me directly at jdeitz at loc.gov or our general scholarly email as well. Uh, all of those will come to the Kluge Center. Thank you. I will now turn this over to, um, to Leroy. Hey, <clears throat> thank you so much, Jana. Um, such fantastic resources available uh, through the Library of Congress and the Kluge Center. I wanted to, uh, because uh, I know it can be challenging when you see a link pop up on your screen and you're like, oh, I want to get that. And so the fellowships link is now in the chat in case you want to just click it and keep it on one of those tabs uh, on your desktop that I know we all have a plenty of those open, uh, but you can go back to it uh, at, at, uh, at your convenience. Um, we are, uh, I'm not sure if Leroy, are you here? I'm here. Oh, excellent, excellent. Uh, so- Good uh, morning. Oh, fantastic. Okay, so uh, we will, I will share uh, the screen here for you. Okay. And, uh, let me uh, just take a moment to uh, sort of introduce uh, Mr. Leroy Bell Jr. He is the Library of Congress reference librarian, and he will give us an overview of the specific research resources uh, that would be helpful to social scientists. One second, please. Can you 
you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Leroy Bell. I am a reference specialist in the Researcher and Reference Services Division of the Library of Congress. This presentation is intended to be an overview of our selected resources in the field of political science that may be of interest to you at the Library of Congress. The Library of Congress collections are rich in primary and secondary resources that are available in many different formats. To get started, let me give you some background information on the Library of Congress. The Library of Congress was founded in 1800, making it the oldest federal cultural institution in the nation. It is the largest library in the world with more than 170 million items. The library is the research arm of the US Congress and is the home of the US Copyright Office. Each working day, the library receives some 15,000 items and adds more than 10,000 items to its collections. Next, I will be giving you a sample of some of the vastness of the library's holdings. 24 million catalog books, 4 million audio materials, this, tapes, talking books, and other recorded formats, 7 million manuscript, 5 million maps, 17 million microform, 1 million moving images, 8 million items of sheet music, 17 visual, materi visual materials, and four, more than 470 languages are represented in the library's global collections. To house the vast collections, the Library of Congress occupies three buildings on Capitol Hill. The Thomas Jefferson Building, built in 1897, the John Adams Building, built in 1938, the James Madison Memorial Building, which was completed in 1981. And also we have other offsite facilities and offsite storage facilities. Within these three buildings, the library has over 20 different reading rooms, each dedicated to offering collections and services in specific formats, subjects, and languages. Next, I will give you a few examples of specific collections that may be useful in the study of political science. These collections exist in many of the specialized reading rooms within the Library of Congress. And they include the general collections, the manuscript collections, motion picture and TV collections, law collections, personal interviews and other history collections, web archiving collections, digital collections, and subscription databases. The collection that I will be reviewing first is the general collections. The general collections include books, pamphlets, journals, newspapers, and other serial publications. The Library of Congress has the largest national collection of materials dealing with the study of American political science. And the library also has major holdings in United States race relations, African-American politics and government. The Library of Congress has a very strong collection of material dealing with international relations. The book collections are complemented by print archives and documents, historical serials, and by collections of personal papers of diplomats and secretaries of state. During this next section, I will be reviewing some manuscript collections. The wealth of these collections is beyond your greatest expectations and provides opportunities for previously unexplored research. The manuscript reading room provides access to 12,000 manuscript collections, totaling 
65, 65 million items to include and not limited to papers of 23 presidents, papers of individuals who have served as Secretary of State, civil rights activists, and organizations. What's included in this collection is the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights Records, papers of two well-known political figures, Patricia Robert Harris, Senator Edward W. Brooke, the Hugh H. Smythe and Mabel H. Smythe papers, the papers of Barnett Rustin, the National Urban League records, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee records, Thurgood Marshall papers, the James Foreman papers, Anne Tannehill papers, the Frederick Douglass papers, the A. Philip Randolph papers, the Roy Wilkins papers, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People records, the Arthur B. Springard papers, and the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porter records. This is just the name of few, okay? This is just a few. Next, the Moving Image and Research Center has a number of collections on political topics, such as we have presidential inaugurations. We have footage on inaugurations from William McKinley to the present. On civil rights, we have television news programs as well as films about civil rights and race relations. We also have political conventions. We have footage on Democratic and Republican national conventions. We also have films on the US House and the US Senate, as well as the NBC news program, Meet the Press. Another important collection is, the law is in the law library. With approximately 2.9 million volumes, the law library's collection of primary and secondary resources constitutes the largest legal collection in the world. The law library is a depository for the complete record of American law, which includes US bills, US congressional bills, resolutions, hearings, and other documents, U.S. federal and state government documents, legal newspapers of major U.S. cities, records and briefs of U.S. Supreme Court and courts of appeal, and it has a large foreign law collection. Progressing on with our overview of LC collections, many personal interviews and oral history collections can be found in the American Folklife Center. I have highlighted four collections. The first is the National Visionary Leadership Project. This collection consists of video cassettes and video discs of about 300 full length oral history interviews with noted African American leaders. The next, which I will highlight, is the Voices of Civil Rights Project collection. This collection consists of oral history interviews, sound and video recordings, photograph and manuscript material documenting memories of 20, 20th century civil rights movements in the United States. The next highlight would be the inauguration 2009 sermons and orations project. This collection includes manuscript, letters, sermons, orations, church programs, audio and video recording, photographs, and other graphic materials created by the public in response to the 2009 election and inauguration of President Barack Obama. The last one I'm going to look at is the Civil Rights History Project collection. This collection includes 108 filmed oral history interviews 
with 136 participants in the civil rights movement in the United States and related documentation. Moving on toward electronic resources available, the Library of Congress Web Archive manages, preserves, and provides access to archived web content selected by subject experts from across the library so that it will be available for researchers today and in the future. Among the archives that may be of interest would be the United States Congressional Archive, which includes member websites from the House of Representatives and Senate, as well as House and Senate Committee websites. Another archive that may be of interest would be the African Government Web Archive, which provides links to information from key African government ministries, institutions, and organizations for the 51 countries in Africa south of the Sahara. Another of interest would be the United States Elections Web Archive. This includes campaign sites archived weekly during the election seasons since the year 2000, documenting sites associated with presidential, congressional, and gubernatorial elections. And last, and soon to be released, the protests against Racism Web Archive. This archive includes websites documenting American and global expressions relating to institutional and systemic racism, police brutality, and unsettled issues. In addition to web archiving, the Library of Congress online digital collections include maps, photographs, letters, diaries, newspapers, sound recordings, and film. Here, I have highlighted a few online digital collections. The Frontline Diplomacy, the Foreign Affairs Oral History Collection of the Association for Government, of the Association for Diplomatic Studies and Training. This collection makes available interview transcripts from oral history archives of the Association for Diplomatic Studies and Training. We also have online uh, the Mary Church Jurel papers, educated, lecturer, suffragists, and civil rights activists. Also included is the African American's Perspectives, materials selected from the Rare Book Collection here at the Library of Congress. This collection includes sermons on racial pride and political activism, annual reports of charitable uh, of charitable organizations, educational organizations, and political organizations, and also speeches by members of Congress. To conclude, I will be reviewing subscription databases uh, at the Library of Congress. The Library of Congress subscribes to over 1,000 subscription databases, which offers indexes to journals, information on library holdings, and other resources in a wide range of subjects. Among them are political science and international relations subject specific databases, such as PAIS, Public Affairs Information Service, Worldwide Political Science Abstracts, JSTOR, Columbia International Affairs Online, Policy File, and Progress Congressional. Some multidisciplinary databases that we have available includes Academic Search Complete and ProQuest Research Library. Some regional and cultural Pacific databases that are available, EXX Africa, which is a business risk intelligence database, Black Studies Center, LGBT Thought and Culture, ProQuest History Vault, which includes race relations in America, and Africa Confidential. The library also has access to numerous historical newspapers, such as ProQuest Historical Newspapers 
and African American newspapers from Newsbank and Redex. My last slide has some links that may be useful to you. There's the Library of Congress website. There's the Library of Congress online catalog. We also have the Ask a Librarian program when you can in inquire with a subject specialist concerning any of these collections. We have the link to the Library of Congress digital collections, our subscription databases link, the link to the Library of Congress web archives, and there's the finding aids to many of the uh, manuscripts that we were talking about, and also available is the Library of Congress research guides. Thank you. And if you have any questions, you can email me, lbell at loc.gov. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we also, uh, so we're really appreciative for uh, all of you to be with us, but um, we also want to thank uh, Jesse Holland for, for joining us as well. He is a recent distinguished visiting scholar and he can talk about his experience at the Kluge and at the library. Uh, Jesse J. Holland is an award-winning writer and journalist. He's the editor of the just released Black Panther, Tales of Wakanda, a uh, prose anthology, and the author of The Black Panther, Who is the Black Panther? Prose novel, which was nominated for an NAACP Image Award in 2019. He is also author of The Invisibles, The Untold Story of African-American Slavery Inside the White House, which was named as the 2017 Silver Medal Award winner in the US History in the Independent Publisher Book Awards and one of the top history books of 2016 by smithsonian.com. Jesse is also the author of Star Wars, The Force Awakens, Finn's Story, Young Adult Novel, and uh, Black Men Built the Capitol, Discovering African American History in and Around Washington, DC. Jesse was a 2019-2020 Distinguished Visiting Scholar in Residence at the John W. Kluge Center of the Library of Congress and is weekend host for C-SPAN Washington Journal. He is a former race and ethnicity writer for the Associated Press, as well as a former White House Supreme Court and Congressional Reporter. And as of fall 2020, Jesse is assistant professor at GWU's School of Media and Public Affairs. With that, I'll turn it over to Jesse Holland. Well, thank you so much for that great introduction. I really appreciate everyone coming to this uh, meeting today. And I want to tell you that, as you heard in the introductions, I wear many hats. Uh, I'm a professor at George Washington University. I host Washington Journal on C-SPAN on Saturdays. Uh, I write fiction books, as you heard with the my just released Black Panther Tales of Wakanda book. I'm also a historian, but my favorite title of all of those has been Distinguished Visiting Scholar at the Kluge Center at the Library of Congress. Uh, with all of the different things I do, it's sometimes difficult to find time and space to actually concentrate on the thing you love the most. Where I actually started was researching African-American history. Uh, my first two books are books of African-American history, uh, Black Men Built the Capitol and The Invisibles, The Untold Story of African-American Slaves in the White House. And my time at the Library of Congress was spent researching what's going to be my third nonfiction book, which you saw, actually you saw the title of it earlier, Sanctuary, The Untold Story of Freedman's Village. I was able to use my time at the Library of Congress to use many of those resources you heard Leroy talk about, to be, be able to use the subscription services for the newspapers.com subscription that allowed me to search the archives for news stories that were written about Freedman's Village. I was able to use the, uh, use the Manuscript Center to go find the papers of the Union General who was the first superintendent of Freedman's Village. I was able to research and find documents, books, microfiche, 
and all of the research material that it in normal times it would take years for you to collect i was able to walk over to a room and actually hold the original document in your hands instead of having to pay a researcher on in another part of the country to go find it for you so the library of congress offers you as researchers and scholars a space where you can actually take the time and concentrate and focus on the issue you are researching. So unfortunately for me, the pandemic happened right in the middle of my research. And in fact, some of my research is still at the LOC. And as soon as they open the doors, I'm gonna go get back in there and get to it. Because actually just listening uh, just now, I realized one of the things I did not take advantage of, and in the in Leroy's presentation, it hit me that I did not, so I got to go back and do it, was the papers of Frederick Douglass, because Frederick Doug Douglass was an advocate of Freedman's Village. For those of you who don't know, Freedman's Village was a African-American town that was started by Confederate General Robert E. Lee's freed slaves. And Freedman's Village sat where Arlington National Cemetery sits today. So all of the luminaries of the time, including Frederick Douglass, were visitors at Freedman's Village. And I can't believe I didn't think of this until literally until Leroy just said it. Frederick Douglass's papers will have what Frederick Douglass said about Freedman's Village in it. And I should have put my hands on those while I was there, but they're not going anywhere. But the thing I have to advocate the most about the Kluge Center is the conversations you can have with the other scholars that are in residence with you. The scholars all get together as a group once a week for lunch, at least we did before, before the pandemic started. The scholars all get together once a week for lunch. And you're able to have conversations about topics that you're not an expert in, but are fascinating to find out about. For example, during my time at the Library of Congress, I was able to have conversations about artificial intelligence. I was able to have conversations about the NAACP and its early origins. I was able to have conversations about government in Europe with all of these people who are experts in their field. And I was able to talk to them about the legacy of enslaved African-Americans in the United States and how that legacy still uh, ties us down to this day. So in addition to being able to research with the finest research collection, I feel, on this planet, with librarians and experts who are there and willing to help you along the way, you also get chance to be exposed to all of these other great thinkers from around the United States. And as a, as a writer as well, just as I was getting there, so was Jason Reynolds. So I was able to sit down and have a conversation with Jason Reynolds. I was able to actually have one of those thought breakfasts with the United States Congress, where I was able to explain to them the research I was doing and why it's important that African-Americans are acknowledged for their work on the US Capitol and other government buildings. So the Kluge Center has the things all scholars look for. It has the information for you to be able to actually do the research that you desperately want to do, that we know often life gets in the way of doing the research that we want to do. The Kluge Center offers you the opportunity to make that research your first and foremost duty. You're surrounding yourself with great thinkers who are able to help you expand your own horizon. As you heard earlier, you're, uh, you're here in Washington, DC, where you can expand your network 
to all of to several or all of the great organizations here in Washington. But more than anything else, you get the chance to work with the great staff at the Library of Congress, where where you have a staff whose not only duty but pleasure is helping people like us find the information we need so we can share it with the world. One of the things that uh, I you hear that people who hear me talk hear me preach all the time is that knowledge is no good unless it's shared. One of the things that the Kluge Center allows us to do is to not only find that knowledge, but be able to share it with the world. So I highly advise anyone who has research that they want to do that the Library of Congress can help you do to take advantage of the programs that Kluge Center offers because there's no better way to move forward in your research and move you towards sharing that knowledge with the rest of the world. So I'll, I'll stop there because I know I'm sure there are probably millions of questions, but I'll stop there and I'm willing to answer any question that I can for anyone who wants to know about experiences at the Kluge Center. Thank you very much, Jesse. Uh, I want to provide an opportunity for, for everyone to be able to ask the questions that they may have for our panelists. Um, you can either feel free to uh, sort of let me know, sort of indicate your hand and I can, uh, you can uh, release your mute and, and open up your screen if you so choose and ask the question. But if you uh, feel more comfortable asking it in the chat uh, or directing it either directly at me or one of the panelists, you're more than welcome to do so as well. So I want to open up the space for uh, questions. And while we're waiting on the questions, I just want to point out one thing that Leroy said, that a lot of the material that the Library of Congress has is already available online. L literally after Leroy said it, I went and opened up the Frederick Douglass papers and found one that I, I immediately emailed to myself that very second. So even if the Library of Congress is, is closed because of the current pandemic, there's still a lot of research that you can do electronically right now, even before you get into the Kluge Center system. Excellent. Thank you. Some questions. I just wanted to say thank you so much for all of you for being here. It was really informative. As somebody who was able to come to the um, come there before, like I've, I've, I've been able to come to the Library of Congress before, back when I was a graduate student to do some research for a fellowship. It's nice to, to kind of start remembering to go back because it was a very short trip that I got to do <laughs> and, and, and for a fellowship for the German Historical Institute um, that does a summer fellowship for, for, for graduate students. Um, so thank you so much. I wanted to hear a little bit more, Jana, about um, the internship that's opening up for HBCU undergrads and graduate students, um, just to let us know a little bit about what, what the project is, because this is a new initiative. I just would like to hear a little bit more. Yes, uh, Jasmine, thank you for that. I, um, that is something that is, a uh, that is a library initiative. So it's, it's not part of the Kluge Center per se. Um, and so I literally have the information that was on that slide. I'll be happy to, uh, to send that to you um, as, as well and maybe find a link. Um, I had offered to um, make that available to, to this audience um, so that unfortunately I don't have a lot more specifics than what was on that slide. Um, but I will tell you having worked with interns at, um, that are um, you know, assigned with the Clooney Center, um, the internship experience is a robust one. Um, they're often um, uh, long enough in, in, in time length that students get a meaningful, um, a real kind of immersive experience in terms of the library. Um, they do have access to work with staff um, um, uh, as well. Um, and as Jesse said, that's one of the, the real strengths, um, the accessibility of the staff at the library uh, in that hands-on kind of way. They also are able in our, in our area to work with directly with scholars who can help show them the kinds of information or the kinds of reference materials they would need to, um, or primary sources they would need to consult. Um, and so for students, um, I appreciate the question because that's also a very good um, um, opportunity and absolutely encourage you to follow up. I can um, provide some more information um, afterwards. Um, as I said, 14 students, I think, is a significant size class and cohort. Um, so I was just thinking about it. 
I'm now a professor, an assistant professor at the University of the District of Columbia, right? So I'm like, oh, of course. So it's even yes. like a, it's like all of this. I didn't hear about this fellowship before, and I was just like, okay, great. great that this exists. So I will send you an email, and and we'll connect later. Absolutely, so thank, you. thank you. And Jasmine, let let me just add in there that uh, the the Kluge Center also has, if I'm not mistaken, Jenna, an internship program as well. And the interns that work through the Kluge Center are a lot are not an hour allowed are encouraged to work with the scholars and the writers that are in the that are that are working at the uh, Kluge Center just then. In fact, one of the interns that I worked with earned himself a credit in the book, a thank you in the Great. acknowledgments for the work that he was able to do during his internship with me. Uh, so, I mean, and I told him before his internship was over, you will see your name in this book because you, the work that you did was worthy and was actually useful. It was not like you went and got coffee. He went and went, went through some primary documents for me and was able to point me in directions that I wouldn't have thought of myself. So these are not internships where people go get lunch and go get coffee for other people. These are internships where it's on the student to make himself or herself available and say, this is something that I'm interested in. Do you mind if I help you? And students who step forward will be embraced by the scholars and say, hey, of course, I would love to get your perspective. I would love to get your help. And it can actually bring about a very interesting and profitable relationship for both the intern and the scholar. Thank, and thank you, Jesse. If I could just add um, that um, interns, in fact, are we do have you know, again, it's selective. We we don't have space is kind of our, our issue in terms of being able to um, um, help as, as as many folks as possible. But we do pair um, the scholars are also paired with these interns. So um, so sometimes they may have a very good fit in terms of that uh, subject matter um, area. Um, and sometimes it's really, it's a learning experience. They're paired with someone they, and they in, and, and inevitably these students report at the end of their time that they have acquired skills and they've learned things that, that are, they're more confident about in terms of the research process or in writing. Um, and in fact, I would also say for those, you know, for those that um, work with, with, with young folks too, just the, the professional development that comes with being able to have professional interactions uh, with mm -hmm. faculty and with others as they go about uh, their own interviews and graduate school applications, et cetera. These are often um, high performing um, uh, students as well um, from diverse backgrounds. We value that. And um, that like Jesse is a very, is, is a, is a very um, good feeling uh, in terms of having those experiences at such a high level. And goodness, Jesse, thank you for that. That's fantastic that the student got the shout out in your, in your publication. That's great. And let me add one more thing that we haven't talked about as much when you talk about the Kluge Center, but the Library of Congress is an absolutely gorgeous work location. We literally are steps away from the main reading room, which I will tell you is the most beautiful room in Washington, D.C., not only because of how it looks, but because of the information that's inside and the library also has all of these other activities that are going on at the same time while you're doing your research. For example, while I was there, the library was opening its Rosa Parks exhibit. Mm. And I was able to attend the opening of the Rosa Parks exhibit and was able to be one of the first people to be inside that exhibit and talk to some of the people who made that happen. So in addition to all of the things you're doing, going, doing your research, you have all of these other wonderful programs going on around you, like the National Book Festival, once again, sponsored by the Library of Congress, like all of these other centers in the Library of Congress are having their events, which if you have the time, they'll come to you and ask you, can you help, can you bring your expertise to some of these events? So it, once again, it's a great place for you to do your research, but it's also a great place for you to show your research and expand your network and find out the people around you who are doing the same thing in the Library of Congress. 
So I, we, I, I don't want to discount that because I don't want to make you think that we're all shoved into little offices and we're like little cloistered monks at desks. No, this is a very expansive. It was for me, it was a very expansive experiment where I was able to focus on my research as well be a, be a part of this huge Library of Congress family with all of these other events going on around as well. Jesse, thank you for that. If I could also just add to that, that um, um, from the uh, former professor days, if, if I could just reference that and say, for those that are looking ahead towards their sabbaticals or time off, right? Uh, a time that you wanna have intensive research time. Um, this is a particular type of, uh, of sabbatical and a different type of opportunity, as you say, you're, you're focused on your research with incredible opportunities to, um, and resources to support um, that intensive focus. But at the same time, you are surrounded by inspirational, <laughs> an inspirational setting, I agree, a beautiful inspirational setting, uh, filled with much history. And then also with the, with the community of, of folks that um, it's invigorating, uh, there are so many things to, um, to take your attention. Scholars often will, will add that when they leave, that just like you, Jesse, that they have other ideas, thanks to the help of Leroy and other staff in, in particular collections that have, that have opened their eyes in a process of discovery to new things that they would love to be able to also add to their, you know, their research list, their to-do list. Um, so all of that, I think, makes it a different type of, um, as you say, research experience. It's not simply that. This is a, a sabbatical plus, <laughs> a, a research time plus, um, that is, is fulfilling for, um, um, you know, the alums that have, uh, that we've surveyed um, really do point out exactly what you're just saying, Jesse. Thank you for that. Could I also just say to Leroy that he that he really highlighted some incredible opportunities. Could we hear more of what he knows about the pending um, soon to be released um, archives on, um, on on protests that were both US based and global? Uh, yes, that, that, that collection is in embargo right now. Ah. So uh, the archiving team was tasked concerning uh, uh, the death of George Floyd and some other issues that were going around in the country to collect uh, information from the Black Lives Matter group and from some of the other groups that were uh, supporting uh, Black Lives Matter, but we also got the other counter groups also to see what they were saying because there was counter protests going on uh, during that time also. So right now, I, th I think the archive is about uh, 112 websites, but uh, it should be available, I believe, in uh, July. Excellent. Thank you for that. Uh, Jenna, would you mind speaking a little bit uh, to sort of some of the opportunities that are available for uh, folks who are earlier in their career, particularly, you know, graduate students and, and sort of early faculty members, et cetera? Mm -hmm. So that's a good that's a good question, Corey. I think that most of our um, opportunities uh, at this moment are for, um, I, I would think of them more as the postdoc category. Um, and so so most of those are for um, for recent graduates. Um, um, usually within the first, I would say, seven years of, um, of, of finishing up, uh, assistant professors um, uh, that are there, of course, they can absolutely make good use of the fellowships that we had listed on that, li on that list. So the Kluge fellowships, there are multiple fellowships awarded every year. Um, it can, um, in, in terms of limit, it can vary based on, on space and, and application, but I will tell you that the staff that support those programs are very flexible in working around um, which semester works best if someone's accepted, uh, working with their dean, uh, their department heads or chairs, um, that sort of thing. So we understand both the, um, the academic kind of um, uh, timeline as well as trying to fit it with when someone would want to be able to arrive and, and be in residence. Um, but those are, those are highly, um, as you can imagine, those are also very, um, um, they're at a good time to help move people ahead professionally. Right? And one of the things that I'll add on here as well is that uh, once you're part of the Kluge Center, um, they never let you go. So <laughs> it, all the time we would have people who were former scholars coming back through. 
uh, to, to present their research or for some of them to continue their research. Because as we all know as researchers that you can't fit all, everything that you're going to research into a certain amount of time. And the Kluge Center has been very flexible about offering research space to former scholars to be able to come in if you need an extra week, if you need an extra couple of days, a place to sit at the Library of Congress to continue your research while you're in town or on your way through. The Kluge Center uh, has always been very, very welcoming back to scholars who have formerly worked there. Um, now, I'm lucky. I'm here in Washington, D.C., so as soon as they reopen the Library of Congress, they'll never get rid of me because uh, I'll be there all the time continuing <laughs> the research uh, on the book that I didn't get a chance to finish. Um, but as we all know as researchers, there's always more to do. And so the, there's, there's, there's this network of former Kluge scholars where, that we still talk to this day, both offline and online. And there's always space and they're always welcoming back to people who have worked there before and still need a couple of extra days to continue your work. So that's one of the great things that, that I've discovered just in this last year, that even if you leave, they, they, still, they will still welcome you back. Because as researchers, we sometimes know that once you leave a place, they don't ever want to see you again. The Kluge Center isn't like that. That's really great. And I, I really appreciate uh, sort of one of the points that you've highlighted in terms of the networking opportunities, the, the opportunities for cross-pollination of ideas and perhaps collab perhaps collaborations. Uh, that is extraordinary and exciting. And you know, at, we're at an academic conference because we enjoy these spaces so much. So uh, so thank you for sort of emphasizing that. One of the things that I, I was curious about uh, is uh, opportunities for students to, so you have the internships indeed, but also, I mean, are there other programs that allow students to develop their skills um, in working with archival material, et cetera? Leroy, do you have any experience in working with scholars and, and the interns that they are um, paired with? Or do you work most, mostly with the, with the scholars directly? I work a lot with the scholars directly, but also uh, for the interns that come in that work at the Kluge Center, mm -hmm. they come in with uh, needing various types of material and things like that. And uh, actually we, we give them uh, a research orientation. They sit in with uh, uh, a lot of school Kluge scholars in terms of uh, learning how to do research at the Library of Congress and learning how to navigate and manage the collections. And so uh, they get really into it. And, and what, I, what I say, they, they are doing a lot of the pick and shovel work because they are digging down real deep in some of the, not I work basically with the general collections, but even in the general collections, they're digging down deep to get a lot of these nice morsels that, that are hard to find. So uh, it's, a, it's, it's a good experience. Very hands-on for them, right? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. I, I, I also remember my research orientation and it was a eye-opening look at being able to actually find and access things in the Library of Congress. Now, if let me just say now that if even if you're not a Kluge Center, Center Scholar, all of us should have our reader's card for the Library of Congress. And I've had a reader's card for years, ever since I moved to Washington, DC in 2000. That was one of the first things I got besides my District of Columbia library card. I went and got a reader's card for the Library of Congress. But I didn't realize until I got to the Kluge Center and did the research orientation that how much of a surface level of research I was doing at the Library of Congress and not actually getting into and actually finding the material that you can that, that's available to you at the LOC. Um, because we'll come in and try to use the Library of Congress without knowing it, without knowing how to, you'll come in and try to use the Library of Congress as if it's a public library. And there's so much more there that you can access that until someone tells you how to get to it, you don't even know to ask for it. 
So if you don't have a reader's card at the Library of Congress, I highly suggest you get one. And if you have a chance to take any type of research orientation from the Library of Congress, I would highly suggest that as well, because there's so much more at the Library of Congress than just books. Most of us think of the Library of Congress as a place, just a, just a repository for books. There's so much more there. I mean, I remember at, while I was there, I was working on, well, I, I was looking at some original maps of Arlington, Virginia that had been scanned in where you could actually figure out exactly where everything was back in 1832. So not so there's so much more there than you, you would find at, the, at a normal library, but you don't even know to look and ask for it without asking someone and going through these uh, research orientations. And let me put one more plug in for the ask a librarian, because there's so many times where you think you're stuck and if you just speak up and ask one of the librarians, why ask one of the staff, you'll find out they can show you how to do it so much quicker than the one week it would take you to figure out how to do it. So even if you're not in researching in, in the library right now, I would take advantage of the ask a librarian function at the Library of Congress to find help to have someone help you find the things that you're looking for. That's wonderful. Any other questions from the audience? In the event uh, that folks weren't able to get uh, your emails when they were up on the slide, may I ask that that everyone, uh, the panelists, just share their their contact information, uh, sort of in the in the chat, uh, just in case there are some questions uh, that are particular to to uh, attendees' uh, research interests and plans to apply for these fantastic fellowships and get access to these resources. Um, well, mine says chat disabled. So, Janet, oh. do, do you mind? Well, okay. If you can enable that for me. If anyone sure. has any questions specifically for me about my experience at the Library of Congress, I am more than and happy to answer. Um, I am a huge advocate of the Kluge Center and the Library of Congress. So, I would, I would, I would totally, totally tell you to take advantage of what the Library of Congress has to offer, because I will tell you that it was a truly, truly enlightening experience for me. Excellent. Well, we're at about time. Uh, I wanna thank uh, our, our panelists for such an informative uh, presentation today. Uh, this is actually really helpful and I'm, I'm getting excited. I'm gonna go uh, look at those resources myself uh, as Leroy was going through all those, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, collections that are available. I started to get a little excited and, you know, so I'm looking forward to jumping on these opportunities and I hope that our, our attendees found some stuff that uh, like invigorated their uh, intellectual curiosity and that they'll reach out. Um, I thank you all again for, for attending the panel and for our, I thank you for our, um, our participants. I have a great rest of the conference and we'll see you uh, in the other panel. So long.